Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. You're listening to Top Traders Unplugged. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I know how valuable your time is, so I'm grateful for you spending some of it here with me today. On today's show, I'm talking to Marty Lewick, co-founder and director of research of Aspect Capital. Marty is well known in the alternative investment industry as one of the co-founders of AHL back in the mid 80s. Marty and his partners at Aspect Capital set out on a quest to democratize the managed futures industry by providing access to these successful quantitative strategies, but without the wrapping of expensive structures and guarantees. And without a doubt, Marty and his partners have been incredibly successful in their quest. At the same time, their legacy of AHL has become the root of so many of the successful European investment managers of our time. Needless to say, this is a conversation that is full of knowledge that you simply can't buy. It's priceless. For those of you who are new to the show, I just want to let you know that you can find all of the show notes, including a full transcript of today's episode on the toptradersonplug.com website. Now let's get started with part one of my conversation. I hope you will enjoy it. Marty, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, Niels, it's my pleasure, actually. This is great. Fantastic. Now, Marty, I think it's fair to say that many people who are involved in the hedge fund industry and certainly people who are involved in the managed futures industry is very familiar with your name and that of your partners from AHL. So instead of me doing my usual summary of some of the key points in your journey so far, I'd like to start a little bit differently today, and I hope that's okay with you. So, uh, so here goes. Let me start out by asking you this question. Imagine that you're invited to a dinner party with people who don't know you. Okay. And a few minutes into the dinner, the lady sitting next to you looks in your eyes. She smiles politely and asks, so Marty, tell me what you do. How do you respond to that? How do you explain what you do? Uh, Niels, typically that's the that's the question I usually dread. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I first of all have to uh, get a sense of whether that that uh, lady is genuinely interested or if she you know knows the finance space. I sure. start with something something fairly neutral like. Um, uh, I, I, I run a quantitative um, uh, investment business, and right. I see see whether her eyes glaze over instantly, um, <laughs> and then change the, the subject. Um, but you know, assuming that uh, she says, "Oh, do tell," or, or, you know, "What's that? What's that for? Yeah. And why do you why do you do it?" Yeah, um, I, I can sort of walk her through a little bit of this of the story that you know, there's a happy accident that I got into uh, quantitative investment research and and applied my originally physics background to to developing these models and then in terms of you know the question of what's it for well i think that you know the 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 sweep of my um my career has sort of you know unwittingly of course i don't think i i set out in the early 80s with this vision in mind but i think with the benefit of hindsight what what we and others in the industry have managed to do in in some sense is um is democratize a a new form of 
of investment that that actually you know I genuinely believe it has a, a, a contribution to make to to pension funds and to you know individuals investment portfolios and Niels if that hasn't put her to sleep or got, <laughs> got talking to the person on the other side of her uh, you know nothing will no no absolutely no and it's funny Marty because actually it's something I struggle with myself I mean when people ask what well, so what do you do I think it's so hard to the uninitiated to come up with an answer which both makes sense and you know is somewhat interesting so it, it uh, you keeps know the conversation going absolutely so I appreciate that now of course we're here to learn about the great things that you do uh, at aspect but you know, we can't ignore that your first company, AHL, had such a profound effect on the whole managed futures industry. So I'd like to spend a good deal of time going all the way back to where your journey begins and find out what led you to where you are today. Because to my knowledge, the AHL story has never really been told to the same degree as the story of the turtles. And for those who don't know that, it's the Richard Dennis and Bill Eckhart experiment that also took place in the mid 80s. Yes. Um, but since they are taking place more or less at the same time, and both had a huge impact for decades after the event, so to speak, I want to be sure that we cover a lot of that background as well today. So please do go back as, as far as you want and, and tell us about your journey and, and how it has unfolded, so to speak. Gosh, Niels, be, be careful what you wish for. I know. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, as, as I said, th this is a happy accident. Right. Um, I studied physics at mm -hmm. Oxford and right. my uh, school friend and then also chum at Oxford was was a, a fellow called Michael Adam mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know he and I uh, you know competed at, at math and physics and um, and um, when Mike le he was a year ahead of me right. at Oxford okay he took a year off and then uh, started working for his father um, and the family business was originally uh, they were they were Mauritian descent and they were involved in uh, physical commodities on, on the London commodity markets. Okay. Uh, Michael went to work for his father and uh, Cyril Adams said, why don't you see if there's anything in, in these technical trading models? So, mm -hmm. you know, here you are, you're about 1983 um, and personal computers were a bit of a rarity and and Michael bought a Hewlett Packard 9816 <laughs> and taught himself to to program in Pascal. Okay. Um I left uh and got my first job at Nomura um January of 1984 mm -hmm. and uh, spent all of my lunches hanging out with Michael and just really thought what he was doing was great and my trying to sell Japanese equities was <laughs> was not so great um, so uh, I I left Nomura after a whole nine months there and so that that was the the last re real job I had um, and uh, started working for Brockham Securities which was the you know, Michael's father's um, small small broking house and um, together we investigated a huge uh, range of uh, trading strategies and sort of distilled it down to some fundamental rules. I'm, mm. I'm glossing over a lot of work. Um, and our first portfolio was six commodity markets. I think we traded cocoa, coffee, sugar, aluminium, copper, and zinc. Okay. And um, and we had uh, twenty five thousand pounds of Adam family money, and we built that first systematic portfolio. Wow. Um, and along the way, Niels, we met this chap, David Harding, mm -hmm. who was a Cambridge graduate, and. Um, we met him, or I met him anyway, when he was working at, for Sabre Fund Management. Sure. And, um, and this, that story, I'm sure David would tell it far better than I, but uh, <laughs> uh, David was the, the understudy, if you will, to a man called Robin Edwards, who was a, a chartist, a fund manager, sure. but it was entirely based on, on chart patterns. So every day, you know, David, the, the, the sorcerer's apprentice, would um, take the... the books off of the shelf and open up the charts and add the latest you know tick data point and um and then in would come the grand vizier and um <laughs> 
you know, determine whether that was indeed a, a rising pennant or a, or a double bottom or a, or a head and shoulders sure. and uh, determine what the day's trading would be. Um, so David and uh, Michael and I, when we met, we said, Struth, if we could, you know, encode um, Robin's rule set, that would be something. And it was just sort of a meeting of minds. Then there was a bit of a, a tussle. You know, the uh, the Sabre folks wanted Michael and I to join them. But uh, in the end, blood was thicker than water. So <laughs> David David joined us in the Adam family business. Right. Um, and in early 87, Michael and his father had a, a difference of opinion on the direction of of the business and, and we left and AHL was founded. We managed to, to, we had one client that had been with us over the transition and so we had a whole hundred thousand dollars of, of investor money that bridged that, um, that uh, interlude. Sure. Um, and then we set up, gosh, uh, February of 1987. Mm-hmm. And we sort of floated around town. We didn't really have office space. We were in my father's office for <laughs> for a few weeks. Then we had a, a cupboard at the back of the Saber office for a while. And I, if I recall, I think Saber were were generous enough. They they took a a stake. They they you know backed us for a while. Okay. Um, later on, we bought those shares back. Mm-hmm. Um, and and eventually, what happened? Uh, serviced offices, and then on to German Street. Right. And. And and the the I think the the relevant thing here is that really you know genuinely Michael David and I didn't know there was an industry doing this in the states. Yes. So you know you talk about the the turtle experiment going on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, actually, David probably read the paper, but right. so he maybe knew about it. But but Michael and I just didn't. And uh, <laughs> um, so you know we woke up and we found that. Um, you know, we were doing something that, you know, where there was where there was precedent, where there w- was an industry. And in fact, it was um, quite a burgeoning industry. But I, I think that that's relevant because we weren't looking over our shoulders at how other people had done it or were doing it. You know, that literally, this was three nerds, um, you know, and so- and we approached approached the process of model development like like a scientific experiment we had the um, you know we had the historical data we had some models that we distilled down to some en- essential characteristics and then we said well can we do this better can we add additional markets can we improve the models do, can we go faster can we go slower can we add more you know components to it so it, it was a scientific exercise, and I think that you know what that DNA, that approach, really took off in the industry. And I would contrast that, and I know it's a it's a gross generalization, and therefore not true. But I think that a lot of the roots of the um, the U.S. Uh, early CTA industry were in you know sort of floor traders that that encoded their rule set. So you look at the the Richard Dennis story which you re- referred to, or um, or, or John Henry. You sure. know these you know very smart folks, but they they had a rule set they were they were comfortable with. And in fact, we came really close to to that um, with Mint. So Mint was a an, a pioneering systematic uh, CTA uh, in the early eighties. And they did a 50-50 joint venture with the Mann Group. Mm. So through the course of the 80s, the Mint funds were marketed by Mann in their um, in their global offices. So Mann, the commodity broking firm, had offices in Ulaanbaatar and and you know Outer Mongolia and all of these places. Thanks sure. to their thanks to their. Uh, uh, two centuries old commodities business, and they started distributing this managed futures fund um, to a, a broadly retail audience. They they also embedded the Mint program inside uh, a guaranteed structure. You remember those with sure. the sort of with a zero coupon bond, and you'd use the um, um, the remaining cash to fund margins mm-hmm. on the um, uh, on the trading account, and Absolutely. that was that was. Just genius, sure. absolute genius. So by the end of the 80s, I think that Mint were probably the first alternative investment shop to be managing more than a billion dollars. Yeah. This is a bit fascinating for me personally because, um, and I want to go more into what happens then, of course, in your story and with man, but if we just take it back a step, because, okay. of course, in my own career, 
I have roots in a roundabout way that goes back to Sabre because when I co-founded okay. Beach Capital Management, we, yep. of course, you know, had roots back to Sabre as well. So the chart books that you're referring to, I've been carrying those myself, you know, around the world as, as well, along with uh, with my co-founders there. But the, pro the, the reason I asked this question, and that is, even 10 years later, we were never able to to computerize the original chart patterns. We see, even though they were mathematically defined, we couldn't yep. do it. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, what was it in the patterns that you were trying to do with them? Or were you just trying to come up with rules that had the same effect as a patent, but not really where the computer needed to recognize the pattern itself? I, I think more that, Niels, that we were really trying to construct a rule set. Actually, we did spend a lot of time trying to figure out a semantic language that could, um, you know, you could articulate Robin's um, arcane sure. uh, <laughs> voodoo. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, one of Michael and my, my early upset, in fact, you know, I'll, I'll credit Michael with it because each of us bought something different to the, uh, to the AHL story. But sure. Michael was an obsessive, um, you know, programmer and right. and one of you know what stood us in good stead at Brockham and AHL was that we didn't just sort of plow in and write a piece of code to test a trading model. Oh no, Michael had to generalize the whole thing. So we had a a, a sophisticated language. You know, it probably very much you know a, a forerunner, a pioneer that that would probably have looked some. Something like an early MATLAB, right. where you you could um, use a um, you know an uh, an inline language to define objects of of time series and apply different um, uh, trading models or parameters or, or constraints on it, and and just very quickly test and develop trading strategies. You didn't actually need to be a a, a C or a Java guru. Right. Um, and and as part of that language, I do recall us trying to, um, you, you know, define chartist rule sets. But I, I don't recall that being particularly successful. And, and as you say, it really turned into a case of finding the sort of um, filter sets that generated the common features. And really, a lot of the, the old trader uh, maxims and chartist features i think can be simplified to you know a, a a more basic set of rules sure now another thing that i think is uh, that i'm very curious about myself um from that time and that is of course that we know uh, that the turtles were really taught uh, breakout methodology meaning you know you have a 20 day high or low or 50 day high or low and then you're on top of that you add some exit rules and you add some risk management uh, you know all this taking place in the mid 80s yep. I'm curious to know if you remember I'm sure you do but if you could share what did the initial AHL model look like because I've always personally been under the impression that it was based more on the moving average kind of methodology but I don't know um, what, what was the what was the where, where did you end up so to speak um, in those early days, well, the the really early days, Niels, um, it, it was more of a breakout model. Okay. Um, okay. And it's uh, you know, I it was a breakout model, and it had a uh, you know, it would scale into a position. So if you saw right. the re the repeated sort of pattern, um, an end day high being supported multiple times, you would scale into a substantial position. Okay. And, um, and, you know, unwittingly, because despite us all having scientific or physics <laughs> backgrounds, you know, this was uncharted territory. Sure. So all of the, all of the, you know, schoolboy errors that we all know, and everyone <laughs> that works for us has, has learned back in sort of uh, finance 101 sure. you know all those those things about um, over optimization and degrees of freedom <laughs> we we did it all so right. we optimized the living daylights <laughs> out of these um, these models in um, in their back history but actually by the ha happy accident of this scaling in mm. uh, feature of the models that sort of 
disempowered the uh, our ability to uh, to over optimize so those were reasonably robust models when we started dabbling in the moving average space that you allude to mm. um, those are far more prone to over optimization because if you do as I say the schoolboy error of trying to optimize what would have worked in every single market <laughs> yeah. over time you come up with a um, you know a boy, a fantastic simulation, but, sure. but, but, but reality doesn't turn out to be nearly yeah. so nice. When was that actually, just before we go back to your story, when, was that, when did you first then move into the sort of moving average type area? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say we moved okay. into it. We, we, we explored it and okay. it became part of the program, but not the, the ah, whole right. program. I'm, I'm not clear on the dates sure. now, but I'm going to say that that was probably in the, in the late 80s or early 90s. Okay. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Anyway, um, I, I, I interrupted your 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 fantastic journey. So, so by all means, go back and tell us what happened when when you also, I guess, got involved with with man uh, relatively early on. I, and I guess, in particular, given the time, I mean, this is really early in 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 a firm's career that suddenly you get approached by a big company. Well. I was going on to make a point because I yeah. was just drawing the, the contrast between the, the sort of um, the U.S. managed futures industry, which was, uh, you know, in my gross generalization or unfair <laughs> generalization was was based on a set of traders rules yeah. uh, versus the AHL happy accident of some scientists who just uh, began distilling and evolving and, and, and uh, a, in the broad sweep of history improving what we did, but it wasn't always a linear, <laughs> linear improvement. Sure. Um, uh, you, you know, w what that turned into in the fullness of time was, you know, I think the difference, um, the difference between the approaches and, uh, and people talk about the AHL DNA or diaspora, uh, you know, uh, I won't say dominating, sure. but, you know, being a, a, a major feature of how the industry has evolved. I think yeah. that was the sort of introduction of the scientific method. Right. But but going back a little bit, I, th I think, you know, a couple of pieces of the story. So as AHL still in, in it was really a couple of years before we um, got very close to man and before they took a stake in us. Um, and the three of us were, you know, o over enthusiastic and distractible kids. I think <laughs> through none of this story did we have the laser like focus that we would all love to claim right. um, but you know as I say Michael was fascinated with the um, with the software language that he was developing and was making his best efforts to commercialize it and sell it mm -hmm. um, David was was very driven by the asset management business and um, you know he would he would be out on the road and um, you know spreading the good word of, of, about these programs that we were running money in and I was using I was somewhere between you know researching the the program and also doing consultancy so we had a number of consulting clients that we would sort of encode their trading businesses on our software and give them commercial advice and we oh, did that okay. um, we did that for a, a, a gilt market making house in London mm -hmm. and then interestingly we did that for one of the commodity divisions at man and um, you know he said well you know we, we see a lot of this fund activity increasingly <laughs> and uh, wonder if you could model you know what the different funds are doing in these various commodity markets and yeah well, of course <laughs> Uh, and, and, and this turned out to be uh, useful intelligence for, for later on in our business when we started to be uh, undermined by, by other, um, sure. other, other market participants. But um, so I think through that, we got to know the man folks. And uh, in 1989, they took a stake in AHL. Mm -hmm. Um, as I said, uh, Mint had been gloriously successful and was probably over a billion dollars and was essentially at capacity. So they had ah, a very, okay. very successful business. Um, they really couldn't trade anymore. Um, and their uh, agents in, in Ulaanbaatar and, and far off corners of, of the earth were just, <laughs> you know, hungry for more of this, this terrific product that sure. sold like hotcakes, generated enormous fees we can come back to that sure. and and performed you know uniquely well um, so man took a stake in us 
you know, put suits on us, <laughs> uh, dressed us up, said no to the commercialization of the software, said no to the uh, consultancy business, and we all, you know, buckled down and started working on, you know, further development of uh, the AHL program and uh, further development of a number of different products. How much assets did you have under management with the uh, in 1989? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I think when we first sold a stake to man, it was a huge 30 million under management. <laughs> 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 And then you know, sc scrolling forward very quickly in 1994, when they bought out the remaining minorities and IPO'd the man group, yeah. I think we were at the heady figure of 300 million. Wow, yeah. I, I think that's right. Sure. Um, and, and that was an interesting journey in and of itself because what man had was uh, the mint business, which was, as I say, over a billion dollars. It was yeah. spilling off enormous revenues. And, sure. and you know, much as I, I, I haven't met Mike Delman, but I've, I've met um, Peter Matthews sure. and, and Larry Height and they're, they're gentlemen and, and very, very smart. Um, I think that the business was so successful so early that at the time they were not committed to building a research effort. So, right. so uh, the, from where we sat, you know, the man, or rather from where the man suits, as we called them, uh, sure. where, from, <laughs> from where they sat, they had this billion dollar business with 24 people Uh, somewhere over in New Jersey, and these three kids and their call it three hundred million dollars of business, and we were over seventy people, you know, with a big trading team, with a big research team, with, with a big technology team, and they, you know, the man guys just said, "Why do we need? Why do we need all this stuff? What? Wow. Why, why do you need all of these researchers and technologists?" And we sort of looked at them incredulously and said, "Well, of course you do, because it's it's research. You have to keep improving it." Um, and 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 that turned out to be the case. So in you know in the mid '90s, I think some of the man funds struggled. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the, the mint funds struggled. Sure, sure. Of, of course, Larry's gone on to be uh, you know super successful with a number of other things sure, he's, sure. he's he's done since then. Um, But uh, you know, AHL sort of started to uh, started to deliver on on the research promise, and um, and a little bit the re the rest is history. Mm, absolutely. Um, but but you know that history was that um, you know at the end of '94, once the IPO had happened, um, Michael, David, and I pretty much went our own ways. Michael left the firm. Um, and started a, a software venture capital firm and had a you know a, a glorious um, set of of products that they developed and and sold on and then rejoined me uh, at Aspect later sure. on. Um, David had a separate research team within the Man Group, Man Quantitative Research, and I sort of held the baby uh, of AHL through the course of 1995. And it was a little bit of a depressing year because on, on the back of, um, you know, 94 was, was challenging performance sure. for the, for the managed the industry, futures. Yeah. Um, and against this backdrop of, so on the one hand, they've got 24 folks spilling off money in the States and 70 plus folks in London, you know, mouths to be fed. Mm. Uh, so I spent a lot of 1995 dismantling much of the research and technology team that we'd built up over the years. Right. Um, and at the end of that year, I just said, not going to do this. Um, left, took a year and a half out and then started Aspect with, um, with Anthony Todd, Eugene Lambert, both of whom had worked at at Aspect, and, and Anthony also was a, an Oxford friend of, of Michael and mine. Sure. And we put in place the, the, you know, really the vision, Aspect's vision was to take the managed futures business that AHL and MAN had developed and bring it to a, an institutional audience. Yeah. A couple of questions um, before we, we move further. Um, What was it initially, sort of back in, in the early days, that led you to feel so strongly that financial markets, because as you say, you're a physicist by background, you're not really sort of a financial background, yeah. but what was it that convinced you to, to, to apply 
models to financial markets uh, because that that's not something that was that common at the time and 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 i would imagine if someone studies physics it's not the first thing you would think of to say oh i can use this for for trading the financial and commodity markets what was it that that made you believe that this is really the best way to um to make an investment strategy that's going to last for for years or decades to come uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a happy accident, Niels. Okay. I, I, I don't think there was there was not a realization or or a determination. I don't know how David would answer that question. Sure, sure. But certainly on my on my part, <laughs> that said, gosh, you know, if we systematize this, we're we're you know we're going to be rich. Right. Um, I, 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 so first of all, I have to credit Michael's father with sure. the why don't you why don't you see if there's anything in this? Okay, and then and then just backing us with some money and and you know what, Niels, there was something in it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> number one and number two, this is this is a, a fun one. I recall that what Mike and I did to amuse ourselves was you know so we had this database of of market data and much of which you know this this tells you how old i am <laughs> we actually we typed in the back history by hand because wow. we the, the brokers would send us over those big green fan fold uh, printouts of historic prices and, sure. and we literally had to type them in but we we came up with this trading game and it would randomly select a market and randomly m multiply it, you know, by by a random multiplier, which could be a negative number. So it might mm -hmm. invert the market mm -hmm. and it would present you with a number of days of data. And then you had to trade. You mm -hmm. had to make a decision. You know, am I going to buy this or sell it or hold or, or you know, various trading rules. Um, and then you'd click the let space bar and move forward a day. And mm. and it was easy. Yeah. So without the emotion and and the information flow that makes markets uh, so challenging for sure. all of us us humans, so challenging and so interesting, I think that there was the sort of realization that clarity of the evidence, if you could just get rid of all of the noise, mm. then there was a lot of information available in, in what the price had done uh, that could inform you know what what the right thing to do was so uh, there wasn't a there wasn't a eureka moment niels it was just sort of gradually um accumulating comfort with this approach mm. that we suddenly found oh this this is a real business you know uh, all of our friends at, at oxford and Cambridge had, you know, the, the, the talented um, folks had all gone off to invest to become investment bankers. And and I remember that the three of us, you know, it felt a little bit like revenge of the nerds because, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it wasn't it wasn't a, uh, something that, as you say, it wasn't something that physicists or scientists thought about doing sure. in those days. Sure. Absolutely. Um, just a question that that pops up in my mind here. When you left man. Um, and of course, as you say, Anthony Todd was was uh, very much part of of, uh, of of this equation at this time. But just out of curiosity, why did you not just start like AHL 2.0 and keeping the team together? Do you think what was the reason that you parted ways with with, with David at the time, other than he maybe that he was a Cambridge and rather than a, an Oxforder? <laughs> <laughs> David had uh, David had different sort of priorities for uh, the business. I th I think he was he he was focused on the research that he and and his team were doing on the other side of London in right. Man Quant Research, and I think that formed the genesis of of Winton Capital Management because sure. uh, I I think he probably found the the man machinery a little bit smothering and uh, and he left and and set up Winton. As I say, Michael was doing something else. We we've remained, you know, good good friends, and we sure. see each other from time to time. But it actually was never a debate where the three okay. of us going to do AHL 2.0. We sort of, I think, we all felt that that was one chapter that had 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 closed, and it was time to to move on. Mm. And you know, sitting down with with uh, Anthony and Eugene and and Michael was a was a, a shareholder and a backer, but he ha he wasn't executive sure. in the business in the early years just because he had his software company you know it really was how can we do this and get it to a broader audience because yeah. the, the the mint business uh sorry well mint and man sure and and ahl within man was was predominantly a retail business niels yeah. it was 
markets. It was retail. It was a uh, structured product. You know, those sure. if, you, if you can call a guaranteed fund a structured product. Um, and uh, it was high fee and it was extremely opaque. Yeah. Um, I think that the, you know, the sales pitch of the, uh, of the early mint funds uh, in all those far flung offices <laughs> was, you know, look at that bottom left to top right. Sure. Very, very clever. Trust me. Yeah. Um, and you can imagine that doesn't go down well uh, with with um, institutional investors today. So the the whole premise of aspect was this this just has to be right for a broader audience. Mm. Um, so we set up a business that would be institutional in in outlook, in in setup, uh, in in fees, um, and. And built from there. Absolutely, you certainly did. Now, before we jump on to the next area, I just wanted to um, to ask you, um, you know, running the research efforts and building aspect along with your partners is obviously a very big part of your life. But what do you do, or what do you like doing when you're not working? Gosh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're you're keeping me uh, on my toes by by jumping around. Sure. Well, uh, then, then I'll I'll take a swerve as well. My, sure. my wife uh, started a um, a children's book publishing company called, oh, wow. called Barefoot Books mm -hmm. uh, shortly after we had our first daughter, twenty two years ago, <laughs> um, and that led us to move our family to the states um, in in two thousand and one. So, uh, Niels, between between aspect, um, you know, commuting back and forth. Forward, uh, across the Atlantic, my wife's business and our four terrific kids or, mm. or, or, or young adults, there, there isn't a lot of time either to relax or for hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think in the early day, you know, I, I was a, a mad keen skier and, and a climber and a mountaineer. Um, and I still have aspirations of getting back to doing all of those th things in due course. Sure. Uh, at, at the moment, I probably just, just run through the woods uh, for relaxation. That's your question. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, give me a short sort of, um, give me a short sort of aspect uh, summary as to just to bring us up to to from the beginnings to now um, uh, and and then I want to learn a little bit more about how you've ended up organizing these things and so on and so forth but but of course aspect in itself is a journey and I would love to learn more and, and share more of this with with the audience thank you Niels so aspect as I say was predicated in in the belief that um, you know, managed futures was too well kept a secret. Yeah. Uh, you know, we felt that statistical models had a had a um, a broad applicability, mm -hmm. and 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 that was the sort of that was the irony here that um, you know having developed these models from the you know I've I've talked about the sort of arcane roots and sure. chartism and to you know. It, gradually you put more scientific rigor on them and you find they are uh, signal processing techniques with certain statistical characteristics um, and it all became in a sense more respectable um, so <laughs> you know in the early days as I say the sure. legacy of the uh, of the managed futures industry driven by the US but it was also you know man and uh, around the world it was this high fee opaque sold product yeah um, and, you know, most self-respecting institutional investors turned up their noses at it. Mm. And, and meanwhile, you saw the advent of statistical arbitrage models and anything that had equities in the title. You know, that that was fair game. You know, mm. that was a decent alternate hedge fund, wasn't it? <laughs> and, and we were a, a separate, slightly scruffier um, <laughs> industry. Sure. So, so that was Aspect's first and foremost mission was to, um, to bring this thing. Because just, you know, I, I, I don't need to tell you, and, and, and I hope I don't need to tell our audience, but just the, the intrinsic characteristics of managed futures, that, you know, liquidity, directional agnosticism, uh, ability to move risk around in, in various places, and the diversification mm. that, it, that it affords a portfolio, you know, it's just, it's... <laughs> To me, it, it, it is, um, if I say it's a no-brainer, but sure. it's, it, 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 it just has an integral part of a balanced portfolio. Yeah. 
Um, so with that kind of um, passion and belief, Belief, you know, we set out to do that. In the early days of, of Aspect, we set out. We had even more ambitious plans to be a quantitative multi-strat shop. So along the way, along the journey, we have developed and, and been modestly successful in the quant equity space. Um, but with um, you know, with all of the trauma of two thousand and eight, sure. we uh, we actually closed down that business and have you know, as we speak now, we are a one product. Uh, well, th- there are various flavors sure. of aspect diversified, sure. but uh, you know, one product managed futures, predominantly trend following business. But sure. but it, it it has, as you say, it's been a been a journey. Yeah. There. So you have more than a hundred people working for you today. How have you? Have you set up the infrastructure, so to speak? I mean, um, nowadays with technology, we see some firms uh, using a lot of um, outsource facilities or services. Um, some people tend to do everything in-house. I imagine you have a pretty big research uh, team within that uh, 100 plus people. Well, what does it look like today running such a big uh, organization that you have? I think, you know, from day one, Niels, we felt that it, to attract the kind of institutions that we wanted to attract, we right. needed to do it uh, thoroughly. Mm. So we didn't manage a dollar of client money until we had enough people that we could man a 24-hour-a-day a uh, trading operation uh, until we had a you know disaster recovery facility. Uh, so that speaks much more to an approach of sort of build it yourself. Yeah. Um, which doesn't mean we're we're luddite. You know, we do. I mean, back in the early days of, of AHL, we'd even write our own back office software. Sure. Um, and that that would be nuts these days. So. You know, we we outsource uh, certainly some software where we can, but a lot of the operational infrastructure and and um, you know is all is all handled in house. Mm. We have organized the research team, and and again, this you know <laughs> I, 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 the evolution of the business and the evolution of the research team and the research process is as much a part of the journey as the evolution of the models themselves. Sure. So that you know development of of the team from once upon a time everyone did everything. Sure. <laughs> you know we've been through phases where we divided the team up and people were sort of siloed by asset classes, mm. uh, and we thought that that created um, you know conflicts and and um, incoherence. Um, and then you you sort of alight on where we are today, where we're divided into the you know of of in fact it's about 120 people in the organization. Okay. Uh, 70 of us are focused on um, research, trading, and technology to support those activities. And okay. there's sort of there's there's focus. There's division of labor. So sure. you've got from you know the the technical production team to the uh, software development team to, that supports both the production systems and the research systems. Mm. You've got a core research team. You've got a dedicated risk management and risk review team. Uh, mm. And I and I want to come back and talk sure. about that for a minute. Sure. Um, and um, and then we have a, a fantastic product management group who basically are sort of uh, an interface between uh, our our clients. Um, and and the research team that sort of protect the research team to stay focused on, sure. on the job on the job at hand, um, and then our technology team, you know, also supports um, uh, data, and you know, and, and gives us the, the tools to keep to keep looking in new areas. Sure. Yeah. No, we're definitely talking much more about uh, risk management and so on and so forth. I wanted to ask you a, a slightly different question, and that is, um, what do you look for? when you want to add new members to your team what are the what are the personal traits that a good researcher um, should have in order to um, you know have a chance to come and work for a firm like yours yeah uh, it's a great question and and i think that one of the one of the lessons along the way is, is that the cultural piece is more important than you might think, mm. um, and uh, and I think that that has you know along the way we've <laughs> we've hired a lot of people and a lot of people have left. Sure. And and the and the core team that we have and now they're they are 
um, you know, really experienced. I think the average tenure with aspect of my core research team is over seven years. Yeah. Some of them well over 10 years. I, I, I'd, I'd say two things in answer to your question. First of all, we don't, you know, there isn't a, a graduate intake. We aren't just, just hoovering up PhDs willy-nilly. I sure. think we, we have certain targeted hires where we may determine that we need a skill set. So, for example, we needed some, uh, some statistical muscle and we went out and, and hired someone who, you know, is, is just the most fantastic statistician I've certainly ever come across. Sure. Um, and, uh, and then we also, you know, and we have similar expertise in, uh, in signal processing um, and, and in another, you know, in other disciplines related to or, or you know, not, not far removed from. I mean, you, you, you will have read the stories of uh, Jim Simons going out and hiring the, um, the uh, speech recognition team. Sure, yes. So, sure. so we haven't done that, but it's the same kind of thought process where you need specific skills. In terms of bringing in junior folks, um, I think it's, you know, obviously these days the, uh, the qualifications are certainly more than Michael, David, and I had um, in terms of, you know, uh, PhDs and, and finance and, and programming uh, skills. But it's, it's an attitude. I mm. think it's an attitude and it's a cultural fit that are the most important features. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's sort of looking, at, I guess, at the, the three C's, the, the character, the competence, and the, the chemistry when, when you want to put together a strong team. And, uh, and on, on that theme, how, how do you build a strong culture in an organization? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I think that's a, a great question. And, and, and I can say it, <laughs> <laughs> I can talk to it because I've, you know, because I've made mistakes along yeah. the way. And, yeah. I, and, um, and I think that the nature of what we all do in, in, in the asset management space is it lends itself to, um, how can I put this delicately to, um, to individuals, you yeah. know, there's there's the cult of the individual. Whether mm. wh whether people start to believe their own hype, or investors want to uh, believe the hype, you uh, you know. So couple that characteristic with the fact that once upon a time, you know, every business has to start somewhere, yeah. and you might, and if you're successful, you might believe your own <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> your own success. Where, where I'm going is that. It's hard for a business to make the transition from being very much top down, mm. character led. So I'm going to tell you lot what we're going to research right. today. It's, you know, making the transition from that to a genuinely, you know, academic, multidisciplinary, collegiate research effort. That's that's actually a harder transition than it may sound and and people uh, you know may overlook that so if you you know as you as you see fledgling businesses set up they may have some some very smart folks at the top of the firm who put together a terrific trading system on day one but as you and I know Niels that trading system is is going to have to evolve sure you know whether whether it's going to decay in the first month of operation or in the first <laughs> decade of operation it is going to need to be improved on yeah. and and experience would tell me that no individual has um you know is able to, to corner the market in genius number mm. one um and number two you know so so your ability to build a team and to trust and to delegate um you know, trust and verify but you know tr uh, to 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 build that robust team is is essential to creating longevity in the program. So, sure. uh, you know, it, it, you can come up with a fantastic system, but I think the real tribute to, you know, to uh, to AHL, to Winton, to Aspect is is that these businesses have continued to evolve. You sure. know, it's it's more the research process that we've all. Um, Uh, subscribe to rather than the genius of of the individual model or any or any component piece along the way yeah speaking on longevity i had another sort of question relating a little bit to that before we move on to sort of more uh, trading oriented parts but um you've also had a very long partnership with key individuals and 
I wonder what is the recipe of keeping a partnership going for such a long time, like in a marriage. I mean, it takes an effort to keep things, you know, alive and well. How how have you guys been so successful at at you know working together for 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 decades without yeah. um, getting tired of of doing it, so to speak? Well. I mean, we did we did have two iterations. So Michael, David, and I all, you know, happened into to one another, sure. and and we we made it work. We yeah. were, you know, the three musketeers, um, <laughs> you know, taking on the world or taking on the man group, or you know, they, sure. they, uh, they, they were great. Man were were absolutely great partners, but um, you know, it just at, at that age, we needed someone to. Um, Focus our sure. ire, sure, of on. course, um, and um, so I, I, the point I'm making is that actually through the transition when we went our separate ways, and then David did his thing at Winton, and we re- we formed Aspect. Mm. You know, I remember Anthony and, and Eugene and I and, and Michael mm. just said, "Look, you know, we have a chance to build something great, and let's do it with the people that we want to work with." Yeah. So uh, we haven't got it right every time. You said the three C's. You know, you sometimes sure. take your eye off the ball, and the chemistry isn't isn't right. But by and large, Niels, I think it's about the people that you choose to work with. Yeah. Um, and and then it's a, it's about commitment because you know I'm sure Anthony could could have killed me at various times along the way, <laughs> and and vice versa. But sure. you you know, <laughs> you uh, you um, you you keep going, and and it's it's been a tremendous tremendous um experience absolutely absolutely i want to <clears throat> i want to shift gear a little bit now and we've talked about sort of the organization and what sort of under underlines uh, uh your success on that side but i want to talk also now about the track record because my contention is a little bit that investors often look at a track record of a manager and they think oh so this is what i'm going to get in the future but of course we know that as you rightly said before uh programs evolve and and therefore a track record isn't necessarily meaningful uh in the current form and and i would argue maybe that uh, to get a better feel you should ask for a back test of the current configuration of any system but usually that is not you know easily available you could say so tell me about how you look at your own track record is there a certain stages one should look at it where you feel that yes this is how we did it at that time and and here's some major upgrades or some changes in philosophy whatever it might be and therefore from this period on maybe that's a, a kind of a separate part of the track record if you if you understand yeah I mean, great, great question. I think if I'm, you know, sitting with a with an, a potential investor or or an investor who's who may be struggling with, sure, you know, per- recent performance compared to what they might have expected in, yeah, in yeah. T- 2008. No, I I am first of all at, at pains to point out that, you know, the length of of the track record of of Aspect and of and of AHL before that and of Brockham Securities before that is more testament to to two things one to um the persistence of predominantly trend following models the persistence and the ability to capture positive returns in multiple economic scenarios that's sort of big takeaway point one sure. the big takeaway point two is that it is what you say it's an evolving process Mm. It's a business. It would be, you know, the analogy I use for our research team and the research process is, so maybe this would have been a better answer to the to the lady at the, at the <laughs> dinner table, um, is it's much akin to pharmaceutical research. Mm-hmm. So not that I've ever worked in pharmaceuticals, but the point there is that at one level you, you look at you know, um, Sandoz or, or Novartis or something like that. And Mm -hmm. you get, you get the, you get a sense of how good that business is at developing new drugs and, and, uh, you know, how good are they, you know, both medically and how good are they at, at exploiting them commercially. Um, but meanwhile, in the bowels of the business, it's not just one drug. You don't just say, you know, how good. Uh, tell me about that um, that one, you know, anti-cholesterol um, 
drug, you know, you, you, it's a pipeline. It's mm. a pipeline of products. So the, the drugs in and of themselves at any time are, are important and are generating the revenue when you take a snapshot of the business, but they continue to evolve. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll end the analogy there because our track record has not bounced around, you know, <laughs> across different, different spectrums sure. of drugs. It is all predicated on the same, you know, fundamental beliefs, you know, yeah. beliefs drivers of market behavior, be behavioral effects that is encaptured in the, in the gr grand term of, of, of trend following or, or momentum trading. But as, as you well know, you know, with, with most of the managers that have survived as, as long as we have, that those models have evolved enormously over mm. time. It's the, the old story of the grandfather. This is my grandfather's axe, but I've, ch I've changed the, um, you know, I've changed the head three times and the handle twice. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's what we've got. Sure. What has been, what has been the biggest changes over time and, 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 or, or is it really small incremental changes or is there something where you look back and, and, and you say, oh, in the last 15 years, um, you know, 2008 or 2009 or whatever it might be, um, you know, we did actually discover something that we would say was a, that was a big upgrade or that was a big find, key finding. I, I will highlight, by and large, it, it is very much an incremental process, sure. and, and, and we, make, we make a virtue of that, because, sure. you know, you, you don't want, the last thing we want to do, especially with our, uh, um, uh, our focus on, you know, institutional investors and a high level of transparency, the last thing you want to do is to surprise sure. an investor. Um, but with the benefit of hindsight, I'd highlight two particular features about the, the evolution of the approach. Mm -hmm. um, the first, in, a, in an odd way, um, the first, Niels, is, is the prevalent, is the importance of risk management and portfolio construction. Right. Because I think this is something that, you know, investors and maybe, uh, you know, uh, managers that haven't been doing it for that long may underestimate the importance of this in the process. And again, I'm saying this because I did. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, y y after all of that, the shenanigans of, uh, of looking at um, uh, uh, chartism and distilling it down into some, some fundamental technical models, you come up with a pretty robust, diversified set of, of medium-term trend-following models, or mm. we did anyway. Mm. And, um, and the neat thing in the... 80s was that the, the range of markets that had sprung up around us, Nils, afforded us a level of diversification that essentially the, the combination of trend following across that range of markets, it risk managed itself. Mm. You know, you didn't have sure. correlated risk shocks. You didn't have, you know, th there was enough intrinsic diversification that if one sector was was melting down, you'd have opportunities in, in another sector. So risk management, you know, I couldn't spell risk sure. um, at, at, at the time. Then a couple of things happen. You know, first of all, I, I'm going to foreshorten this, but, uh, you know, you got to an era where, I think that some of those trend following models became less efficient. You mm -hmm. got to an era where markets did become more homogenous. So right. there was bo there's both a, a sort of macro effect as your pension fund manager in Japan be begins to hold a similar looking portfolio to your, your pension fund manager in Sacramento. Mm. Whereas, you know, once upon a time they didn't. It was sure. much more parochial. So you begin to get a greater, you know, coherence of, of, of of both investor holdings and then also with the advent of of var metrics uh, and that approach to risk management you also got the sort of more correlated response to events so mm. that everyone around the world who thought they were doing independent things would react in the same way to to an event so in response to those kind of increasing correlations in the markets and increasing propensity for shock effects uh we both aspect and and as an industry began to look for sources of diversification and once you start to diversify obviously markets is is one axis and time sure. scales is another but once you start putting in other models then how you bind them together and what admixture becomes super 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 important and, mm. and i'm sure yeah you know i'm sure this is kind of obvious but you know it's been an area that we've focused 
a lot on. How do you put them together carefully? How do you make sure you constrain? Because, you know, just the simple thought experiment, if I take two models which have, you know, no, um, you know, zero correlation between them, sure. and I uh, leverage them up to achieve the same standard deviation of return as one model on its own, um, well, hurrah, I've just improved my returns, but I've also let the kurtosis creep out. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, it becomes increasingly important as you make the portfolio more complex that you deal explicitly with all of the edge cases, the risk management ed edge cases. Mm -hmm. And that's actually stood us in good stead as the markets have gone really, um, you know, into into strange places since since 2009. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and since you mentioned that, what what have you learned in this uh, last few years in terms of of um, trading and systematic models and, and, and how the environment plays such a key role uh, in, in all of this? Um, um, I'm, I'm making a note to come back to a question you asked sure, earlier, but... Sure. but so one, you know, oh gosh, in in this in this environment has has had a, a, we could spend another another session talking about this because, uh, so clearly in a period of underperformance for the strategy, sure. you know, we can, it's human nature. Why is it underperforming? What's mm. going wrong here? Ah, you know, I I I invested in you, Marty, because I saw your two thousand and eight performance. What mm. what are you doing? You know, um, <laughs> and and is that. Um, you know, it, are you have you all saturated the markets? Have market dynamics changed? Has trend following stopped working? You know, it's again. all of those questions. Yeah. Uh, again, and and you just hit the nail on the head. So <laughs> you know, I I don't want to appear glib. So sure. of course we investigate all of those things. We look at you know both our our market footprint and what we think is the the footprint of our entire industry to satisfy ourselves that we're not you know this isn't shooting ourselves in the foot that's mm. happened here um we look at the low volatility environment and what that is likely to do to both the opportunity set and to the risk management challenge mm. and it's really you know it's been a trying time but then I'm. I, I guess, in one sense, I'm fortunate or or cursed sure. with ha having lived through, a, you know, periods like this before. So Absolutely. you know, after after 1987, a lot of parallels. There was, you know, there was a a, a great after the the uh, September cra uh, October crash of sure. 87. There was a huge run up. Managed futures delivered its what do we call it these? What's this this month's protection? Expression? I don't know. <laughs> crisis alpha. Crisis, crisis alpha. alpha. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Well, we delivered our crisis alpha, and it went roaring uh, profitable into to 1988, and then basically hit the doldrums. Mm. And you know the analogies um, between then and now in terms of gosh recession bank savings and loans crisis remember sure. that one yeah um government intervention managing the yield curve uh, uh suppression of sort of risk appetite a lot of similarities mm. and and even you've got to dig at scratch a little bit at the hl track record but it took from the high in the middle of 1988 mm -hmm. i don't think I don't think AHL was back in new highs f until about sometime in either 93 or 94. Yeah. And it was, it was, so it was a similar length to the, the doldrums sure. that we've been in here. Um, it was, uh, it, it actually didn't end neatly. It wasn't just a sort of pleasant recovery of, of, uh, favorable returns. I think we had, an, you know, just when you thought things were getting better, we got <laughs> kicked in the teeth by a surprise rate hike in 94. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that sort of presaged, it, it almost felt like the tubes had been cleared, The mar you know, and, and the starting gun went off and, and the markets returned, if you will, to some sense of normality, whatever, you, 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 you know, your, your impression of normality sure. is. And there was a great run of performance. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not predicting that, but sure. what I'm saying is that I draw comfort from having been through it before um, that actually provided the models are able to adapt yes. to the fact that no two days, you know, are going to be the same. And and you know that's the beauty of of what what we do because it's not scenario specific. So the the models can adapt to whatever the markets uh, present. Num number one, um, you know, it, it does speak to the uh, persistence and um, 
you know, having having confidence in in the approach. Mm. And I think, I mean, I think the other thing that people should do uh, if all the, if they want to sort of satisfy themselves about you know why these strategies shouldn't actually make money in environment in, in, in environment we've just been through is just look at the price range compression that we've seen because just looking at what's the high and the low been for the last sort of on a rolling three or six months basis it is so clear what happens to the prices uh, you know a few years back and and when you do trade momentum um, and and the price ranges compress as they yep. have done it's very easy to visually see Um, that we shouldn't be making money yet it is so difficult for investors to accept that and what I think is even more interesting is that now that we've seen a lot in the news uh, recently and and in the last sort of years uh, about you know trend following not working and all of these things that normally pops up a lot of the Uh, longer term maybe uh, trend following strategies and they're all calling back to all-time highs again but people are not noticing it they're just obviously focusing on on when things are not working but they're not really focusing on the fact that we're now back to all-time highs and i think you guys are as well and and many people so It, it's very interesting, and I completely agree with everything you said. So, um, so, so that's true. And and, and Niels, the the, the the thread that I, I forgot sure. there was just yeah. you know it, it reconfirmed my belief that um you know uh, that a systematic approach is, I, I mean horses for courses, sure. and there there are some great macro traders. But I can tell you, I'm glad I do what I do rather than yeah. being a macro trader because you know. How many times do you think folks have said, "Well, yields can't go any lower than this"? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, it's interesting. Now, with all of that content or context, I should say, that we've now put around this frame, tell me about the diversified program today. How does it look uh, in, in, in sort of visually? What, what, what does it yep. look like? Well, um, I, I'm just going to tie in one other piece yeah. to an earlier question, because sure. um, you said, so uh, uh, by and large, it, it, it has been a, a very much a gradual evolution. If I look back, uh, I think that the the focus on risk management, both uh, as an activity in the business and also as an implicit component to how we build it and put it together and, and run it, that's been a major feature yeah. of, of how the program has evolved. The other thing is, it actually is is in the period of 2004-2005 mm-hmm. where the trend capture models transitioned from what, what we, a binary implementation, if you will, to an analog implementation. And, that, and that's interesting. Can you explain that a bit? Well, um, I think about breakout models. Mm-hmm. Typically, you, you know, uh, either your model is either long, short, yeah. or out. Yeah. And the way we implemented the predominantly implemented again, there were varieties on this, but the early AHL and and early aspect models sure. were uh, a range of binary models across across a range of different time scales. Sure. So that meant that as you'd scale in and out of a trend, you'd change. You would. Tr- trade in discrete chunks yep. so a model would would essentially flip its sign mm-hmm. which meant that when that trade was delivered it it sort of came out as a belch right. of um, uh, of a considerable amount of trading and uh, we thought little of it because that's the way we had always done it mm-hmm. and by by 2004 in particular a couple of trends converged or effects converged number one um, actually aspect was doing reasonably well. We had had a run of good performance. We had, um, you know, managed to raise assets. So I think we were a a fairly sizable account for Mm -hmm. for many of our brokers and, and, um, and uh, market makers. And, um, and when we'd hit one of those discrete trading points, I'm sure it was a very attractive piece of flow. (laughs) So um, what we, you know, so first of all, we, were noticeable. Sure. Secondly, there was an era of, uh, I want to highlight in the FX markets that this was the era of disintermediation of the interbank market. Do you remember right. that? Yes. So, you know, as it, beca- you know, as it became more democratized and everyone had access to mm-hmm. the same price feeds, sure. well, you know, the, 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 uh, the bank trading desks had to you know, had to make a, a living yeah. and um, and spent time understanding our models. So back to the um, sure, uh, back to the, you know the early point about being being picked 
kicked off. But yeah. um, so uh, what that told us was that our, we just had too much of a market impact. We were too visible to the markets. So around that period, there there was a uh, same same effects we were capturing Niels, but in a different way that meant that our entry and exit to the markets was much much smoother sure. and effectively invisible so since then thanks for listening to top traders unplugged if you feel you learned something of value from today's episode the best way to stay updated is to go on over to itunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released we have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.